Well, we all know those dreams where we dream about being late or sleeping through some major significant event in our lives. We all have some kind of fear that we're not good enough and not prepared enough. You know, preachers have dreams about coming to the pulpit and not having any notes and not having prepared anything. You know the kind of thing. You have those kinds of dreams. Dreams are often about arriving late for an event, missing the train, missing the plane that's taking us to our destination. This dream, this parable, really points out to us some of the deeper yearnings of the soul. In the life of the Spirit, there is a profound sense of timing. We have a sense that there is a right time to have arrived somewhere spiritually within our own souls. Howard Thurman has always touched me with his insistence on the temptation to postpone, that we're all tempted all the time to put off, to procrastinate spiritually. That, well, we'll we'll do that when we get around to it. But the spiritual life is a moving and growing dynamic uh, happening within us. And sometimes that growth isn't linear. It's not just moving forwards. It's round and round, sometimes moving backwards, side to side. It, it's, a, it's a movement that never stops. Uh, but it's a movement that has to keep moving. The marriage ceremony is a rite of passage. It marks our transition, we hope, from adolescence to mature adulthood. It prepares us for the possibility of giving life to another human being. It it marks our graduation to be a player in the world rather than a passive recipient. It is internally horrifying to us that we might not be ready or worse still sound asleep when the one moment of opportunity comes our way. It's our worst nightmare. And in order to be prepared, we need to have an internal conversation and hear all the voices that are speaking in our hearts. To say it's five of one and five of the other is probably an oversimplification. Most of us are much more complicated than that would suggest. There are lots of different internal voices guiding us and advising us in our spiritual lives. And it's certainly not a matter of whether you have a supply of oil or not. Our internal selves tend to be very complex and diverse. We're a wonderful mix of wisdom and foolishness. We spend our lives figuring out who can really make the most sense of the world within us. And by the way, it's never too late to explore the inward journey. You can never be too old. For many of us, it's only in later life that we feel the freedom to take the risks necessary to have that kind of inner dialogue. If this notion is new to you, maybe start keeping a journal. Write down everything that comes into your mind and onto your heart. The random thoughts, the feelings, the ideas that pop up in your brain. Look out for intuitions and images that come unannounced. Monitor dreams that most people would dismiss as weird or bizarre. The life of the soul should always have a feeling of fluidity, of change, of growth. It'll never be rigid or solidified. And I truly believe this is what Jesus was getting at in this parable. The kingdom of heaven is primarily about an inner journey, an inner flexibility of the spirit that enables us to be fully awake, fully present in the moment as we respond to what's going on in the world around us. The kingdom of heaven is the opposite of denial. It's the opposite of pretending that the real world isn't there. It's engaging the world out there in all its pain and in all its agony and allowing ourselves to experience it in a mature, loving way so that the kingdom of heaven can be made real in us and through us. Living with the reality of the ten bridesmaids enables us to be awake in a sin-filled world and not be caught up in it in such a way that we're overwhelmed by it. The kingdom of heaven calls us, I seem to be quoting Kipling again, uh, to keep our heads when all around us are losing theirs and blaming us for the problem. We keep our heads, we stay focused. We are awake and prepared. 
It's when we stay spiritually awake that we can respond to the needs as they present themselves on God's time schedule and not simply when it's convenient for us. I think you may be interested to hear some of the conversations I have had with couples who are getting married. Oh my goodness, getting married sometimes just feels like such a fool's errand. The, well, weddings are just so complicated. I mean, you've got to get the flowers organized, you've got to get the meal, you've got to decide. There's always a disagreement about what the invitation should look like. You know, there are a thousand details, and they're all so foolish, amen, compared with the fact that you're creating a marriage. Hello? And I'll say to couples, look, it doesn't matter what happens on the day in terms of all the logistics. They can all fall apart completely, and you can still have a wonderful marriage. But it's the marriage that matters, not the wedding day. Amen? Amen. Ah, and I'll say to them, when you get to the day, please try to put all the logistics out of your mind. It's not about the flowers or the clothes or the menu. It's about the two of you building a relationship of love and trust that will endure for years into the future. And boy, is that difficult for people to hear. Very, very difficult. And it's no easier, by the way, with couples coming back for the second time or the third time. They still get starstruck and still get caught up in all the details. But in spite of all of my and our cynicism, marriage is all about hope. I noticed in uh, Harper's Magazine this week that uh, I should have got the numbers to quote. Um, I believe the numbers are that it, it's two out of seven uh, people under the age of 30 in the United States believe that marriage is an outdated institution, that we should do away with it but 19 out of 20 say they intend to get married. <laughs> you see that there is in the human soul a, a deep yearning for commitment and relationship and, and for something greater and something better than what we know within ourselves. There is a sense of anticipation of great things to come, deep realities that will endure and so it is with our internal marriage. That, that happens within our own souls as we bring together our own opposites and contradictions, our fears and our worries find peace with our hopes and our dreams. Our old guilts and anxieties find trusted partners in our own self-confidence and abiding faith. Those without the batteries in their flashlight find the batteries. An internal relationship is possible. God is at work creating something new. I do see marriage, both internal and external, as essentially sacramental. I, I've often said to, this is very unmethodist, by the way. I could be, you know, I'm being a heretic here. But in the Catholic tradition, marriage is a sacrament. I like that. I like the notion that when a couple make their vows to each other, something almost magical happens, that God is involved in a powerful, mystical way, creating something greater than they ever imagined. Well, that happens within you and me. A miracle happens in your life and in mine. Transformation begins when we enable this inner marriage of who we are, our wise selves, our foolish selves, our confused selves, and our faithful selves to come together. Well, I couldn't end today without singing the chorus. There's a chorus that I know a lot of you sang in Sunday school or at summer camp. So join me, if you will. Do you remember this one? Give me oil in my lamp. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna. Sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. See, we can be Baptists when we want to. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>